Again, thank you all for joining us today on uh, Venable's privacy update on new state data privacy laws. I'm Mike Signorelli, a partner in our privacy and data security group, being joined today um, by Jamie Danker, Senior Director of Cybersecurity and Privacy Services, and Ali Montecolo, an attorney in our privacy and data security group. Next slide, please. So we plan to provide you a, a baseline on developments in state privacy, uh, particularly with the new legislation that's passed. What seems to be in the last four weeks, we've almost doubled, if not more than doubled, the number of data privacy laws in the United States. But we're going to really highlight commonality from state to state, but also key in on differences that we're seeing develop in this patchwork starting to emerge. I think you'll see that it's coming a compelling argument for the need for a national preemptive data law. Um, and hopefully Congress will uh, act soon um, and help settle some of the disharmony that we see develop across the states. We're all familiar with the original six, California, Nevada, Utah, Colorado, Virginia, and Connecticut. Um, but we'll see now as we move forward that we've more than doubled the number of states. Um, and we're gonna, go through the main developments. Um, we won't spend too much time looking at the current laws, um, though we will just as a baseline, because it's important to compare and contrast about where the new states are, new laws are, are headed. Um, so we will cover a little bit, but predominantly we're gonna talk mostly about what has happened in the last few weeks, and but then also have a spotlight on Tennessee. This is a new development, um, but we haven't seen actually get enacted anywhere other than Tennessee, but the inclusion of the NIST privacy framework. We saw efforts in Ohio the last couple of years where it came close to passing with any kind of NIST re related requirement, but we now have seen for the first time a state actually pass both chambers signed by the governor and enacting the law reference to the, the NIST privacy framework. Next slide. This is your last uh, heads up. If you haven't um, prepared, um, be on warning that July 1st, Colorado, Connecticut both become enforceable. Um, and as well as the California regulations, um, those two. And then we have Utah at the end of the year um, to keep a heads out to your nearing New Year's and your festivities seems far away here in the hot summer of DC, uh, but that will be here before you, you know it. So here, just at a glance, um, if you joined any of our webinars or updates in the past, you probably have seen this before. Um, at a high level in the U.S. as the states pass legislation, we are still seeing similarities. There are notice transparency bills. They are opt-out bills for specific practices, be it sales, targeted at advertising, and some other areas. And there are specific rights created by law. Um, rights of access, deletion, correction, though you'll see here in this chart that not every state has adopted the same set of rights, nor do they define them exactly the same. Some apply rights based on the data where it's collected, how it's sourced, whereas others, it's anything that's maintained. And then there are different exceptions based on how the data is held, whether it's pseudonymized um, or an identifiable form. But you can see that there is, again, the theme of commonality through the states, um, this idea of providing access, deletion, correction, opting out of sale, though the definition of sale does vary from state to state, whether it's monetary consideration or monetary or valuable consideration. So we see some differences there. Um, the idea of targeted advertising being regulated, it's captured in um, pretty much every state except for Nevada. And there's a difference in how those terms are named and slightly defined when you compare California to the other, other states. Where there's more significant difference in variation, we see that around sensitive data. Ali will later on go through some of the categories of what constitutes sensitive information, but we note that it's not regulated in the same way. In California, it's subject to a right to opt out and limiting processing. Utah has a notice and opt out requirement where Colorado, Connecticut, and Virginia have followed an opt in approach. And then when you get to assessments, data um, privacy impact assessments, not all states, but the majority of states currently with effective laws do have assessment requirements. And in California, those requirements are under consideration through rulemaking. 
Or the greatest variation, more so than sensitive data, comes with this idea of universal opt-out mechanisms. About half the states with effective laws have some mechanism recognized by law, but how those are implemented, if there's any verification requirements, any safeguards to ensure that those are set by an actual user and not by default, varies, and that is varied even more so based on regulation in California and Colorado. Some highlights on enforcement. Um, no state has a private right of action for the privacy sections of the um, operative terms, though California does have a narrow private right of action related to, to breaches. Uh, all states have recognized um, some form of a cure period, though some states have sunset that or will be sunsetting. For example, California had a 30-day cure period that will that is sunset. Now it's at the discretion of the AG and agency. And we'll note that we have seen that the AG uh, office is moving forward and, and pushing beyond just cure periods. Um, Virginia has a 30-day cure period. Colorado, Connecticut, both 60-day cure periods, but those will sunset um, at the end of 2024 going into 2025. Utah will retain the cure period for 30 days, and Nevada has a narrow cure period um, available in, in certain um, contexts. On the regulatory front, um, this is where really the disharmony takes root, is that um, some states under the under statute grant rulemaking authority to the attorney general or some other division agency of the state. California has gone through several rulemakings already. Um, one being um, under the CCPA and then the other the CPRA with the effective date, um, just a few weeks or enforcement date for those regulations just a few weeks away, but already are under um, new rulemakings uh, around cyber audits, assessments, automated decision making, and have indicated through board meetings, um, public board meetings, that they'll be looking at connected devices, artificial intelligence. The expectation is that they would continue to do rulemaking going forward. Colorado also had a rulemaking process that concluded earlier this year uh, with the enforcement date for that being July 1st. So let's now jump to why we all met here today um, and what has happened in the last few weeks. And I'll try to decipher this for you. Um, this we put together 48 hours ago and it's already out of date. Um, in the interim, Nevada and Connecticut and Louisiana have all pushed over new legislation through the chamber, both chambers and are on their way to, um, to the governor's desk. We'll talk a little bit more about those in detail, but this is a, a picture in time, albeit a short picture in time. But you can see in the predominantly blue colored states, these are uh, states that have passed omnibus privacy legislation. We've added to the mix Montana, Iowa, Indiana, Tennessee, Texas, Florida, we have seen what we would consider maybe sectorial laws or focused in particular areas on types of data like consumer health data. Um, laws passed in Washington uh, and in New York just in the last couple of weeks. Um, and we've seen additional um, laws passed around children's safety and privacy. That's coming in Utah, Arkansas, now Louisiana. So um, each year, uh, almost two thirds, if not more, the states consider legislation and we still have quite a ways to go before the end of the year. I wanna highlight a, a few of the trends that we're seeing um, develop in the states beyond um, simply just consumer privacy as to suggest that it's simple uh, in and of itself, but we have some, some states, some legislatures focusing on types of data, particularly around children. We saw two laws passed um, in Utah and Arkansas, or two states, there's actually multiple um, laws passed in Utah in this area, but focusing on social media companies. And just to highlight a few things here, because we're focusing more on omnibus consumer privacy, um, but new requirements around the need for parental consent for the under the age of 18 for new account holders, limiting hours in which the users can access those platforms, and a complete ban uh, in Utah on advertising. We didn't see that carry over into Arkansas. And in Louisiana, late in session, um, we have seen some amendments come through that will allow some forms of advertising, which is important to ensure that that content is available to minors. Um, and the main subsidy for content online is advertising. So removing advertising does change the complexity of what is available and services available to, to minors. 
Texas, um, as you'll see on the next slide, also um, passed uh, and enacted new legislation focused on children. Some of the same concepts about um, the age of regis registration, needing um, tools to allow parents to have control on what their um, children may be doing uh, on social media platforms. But we'll also note that Texas passed SB 2105. This is a data broker registration bill following California and Vermont, um, adding new requirements for this sector of the market. And before anyone thinks that it only applies to a certain um, group of companies, the way that these laws are defined are rather broad um, and capture much more than what you would can think as a traditional data broker. But in Texas, adding a registration requirement, new notice obligations, uh, as well as um, vesting rulemaking authority with the Secretary of State to provide guidance around notices and, and the elements of notice. Other states considering similar registration requirements, California, Delaware, New York, um, and Oregon. So we'll see how those um, progress through the end of the year. Up next um, is the consumer health data. Um, Washington for the last few years had been a leader in trying to move omnibus consumer privacy legislation and really some of the legislation they've considered and unable to, to move all the way through both chambers has been the DNA of what we've seen develop in Virginia, Colorado, and, and Connecticut, diverging away from the approach that, that California took. But this year, they moved and focused on consumer health data. Um, what's interesting in that is the breadth of what is covered um, under that definition of consumer health data. And it's any personal information that is linked or reasonably linkable to a consumer that identifies the consumer's past, present, future physical or mental health status. We'll note that in Nevada, um, which recently passed um, a law similar to this, but with a different definition um, where the covered entity is using that information to identify somebody's consumer, sorry, past, present, future physical or mental health status. So seemingly si similar concepts and approaches and governing the same data, but with different scopes of what's covered, what's not covered. And another interesting feature here, in addition to the private right of action that we see many states adopting in this narrow context, um, is this idea of geofencing and putting limits on how geofence, uh, geofences may be used, location data may be used um, for um, messaging, advertising, and compliance purposes. Which, what's unique about this is that of the states that have moved, and New York is one of them as well, none of them have used the same definition of a geofence um, and how that polygon is drawn around a particular location. And it varies um, mainly on the distance from the point geofence, anywhere from um, 1,750 feet to over 2,000 feet. And so we see some variation about how you draw that. And you think about operationally um, the distinctions and differences um, that may be drawn based on those geofences. So we'll see how those um, develop and progress in other states. I'll note that many of the effective dates are, are very soon um, for these new laws. If you look at um, Washington and New York, they're both coming up next month. So with that, um, I will now hand over to Allie, who will do the deep dive into the new ominous, uh, not ominous, but omnibus uh, privacy legislation and law. Yeah, maybe a little um, ominous. Uh, thank you, Mike. Um, yeah, so now we'll jump into the, the deeper dive on the newer laws um, with a comparison back to the older laws to kind of draw some context there. Um, as Mike mentioned, we have six new omnibus laws as of today. Um, Florida, Montana, Iowa, Tennessee, Indiana, and Texas that have kind of uh, passed just this year. Um, this is that timeline slide again, just to, to orient ourselves. Again, we're kind of um, living in this area where after that darker shade of blue, that's where we are. So we're coming up on Colorado and Connecticut coming into effect. Utah will take effect also this year. And then these newer laws will take effect sometime between 2024 and 2026, as you can see here. Um, with Florida and Texas coming first in 2024, then Montana, then Iowa, then Tennessee, then Indiana. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this slide, um, just talking through some of the nuances here. Um, this is just at a glance, as you know, we had that at a glance slide up front for the first six. Um, and now this also includes uh, the, the most recent six, that orange line there sort of delineating um, the six that have happened this year, kind of on the right side of that line. 
Um, I'll just highlight at a broad strokes, um, all of these laws are um, notice and choice laws, um, meaning there are transparency requirements, that's the notice element, and choice opportunities through various consumer rights. So no state law quite yet has taken the more GDPR-esque approach where there's a legal basis of processing required kind of out the at, at, or at the outset to um, process personal data. We're still in this notice and choice framework across these omnibus state laws. The transparency requirements usually take the form of privacy policies. So all of these laws have some sort of privacy policy requirement, but what needs to be included in those policies may differ from state to state. And of course, based on your activities, I'll note that the states with the regulations, so that being California and Colorado now, have more robust notice requirements. So for example, California doesn't just have the privacy policy notice requirement, but a requirement related to notice at collection of personal information, a notice of the right to limit the use and disclosure of sensitive personal information, a notice of the right to opt out, notice of financial incentives if you, the business, offer those types of things. So there are more robust notice requirements, I would say, on the whole in these laws that do have regulations to implement them. So as you can see at this chart, um, and I mentioned there are consumer rights are kind of, um, you know, across all of the laws, there are consumer rights. You can see there are consumer rights of access, deletion, correction, and opt-outs across many of these laws. Nevada, as you can see, is a more limited regime, um, providing only for a right to opt out of sales. Uh, Utah and Iowa do not provide for correction, as you can see here, um, but the rest of the states, you know, kind of do. Um, California here has an opt out of sharing for cross contextual behavioral advertising, which is, as Mike mentioned, um, you know, the targeting of advertising to a consumer based on the consumer's personal information obtained from the consumer's activities across businesses, distinctly branded websites, applications or services, other than the business distinctly branded website application or service with which the consumer intentionally interacts. So California is the unique one with that type of right. Um, many of the other states have an opt out of targeted advertising, which they generally define as displaying advertisements to a consumer where the advertisement is selected based on personal data obtained from that consumer's activities over time and across non-affiliated, non-affiliated um, websites or online applications to predict such consumers' preferences or interests subject to certain exceptions. Um, also, as you can see, there's an opt-out of profiling in most states, um, just not um, as of right now, California, Nevada, Utah, or Iowa. Profiling is generally defined um, uniformly across the states as any form of automated processing performed on personal data to evaluate, analyze, or predict personal aspects related to an identified or identifiable natural person's economic situation, uh, health, um, et cetera. Um, however, note that Colorado, as I mentioned kind of before, the states that have regulations do have more ticky tacky requirements on many of these aspects. Colorado, because it has regulations, has added kind of more meat on the bones of automated processing, which is inherent in this profiling opt out. Um, with respect to how much human review has been assigned to that type of profiling and what kind of requirements are, are there based on the level of human review. So that's just another reminder to, um, you know, pay take close attention to those regulations as they do provide a lot more detail on what is required related to the rights. Then there are appeals processes for denials of consumer rights requests across many of the states, as you can see here. And then there's a uh, sensitive data choice across many of the states. Most states have an opt-in, as you can see here, but some do have an opt-out, including Utah and Iowa, and notably actually California. Uh, California's opt-out is, is, is somewhat limited. Um, the right is actually couched as a right to limit the use and disclosure of sensitive personal information to certain basic uses, such as use that's reasonably necessary to perform services or provide goods reasonably expected by an average consumer, um, use to ensure security or integrity, short-term transient use, such as non-personalized advertising, um, providing customer service, processing transactions, and quality or safety assurance. Um, the California opt-out is also um, interesting because it does explicitly state in the law that sensitive personal information that is collected or processed without the purpose of inferring characteristics about a consumer is not subject to an op that opt-out. So, you know, ostensibly, if a business is not processing sensitive data to make those kinds of inferences, it may be out of scope here. So those are just some nuances on California. 
Um, additionally, there are assessment requirements. We won't spend too much time here because the very next slide we dive deeper into assessments, but there are assessment requirements across many of the states. Um, and let's just briefly want to hit pseudonymous data, as, as Mike had mentioned on the other slide. Um, pseudonymous data is personal data that cannot be attributed to a specific natural person without the use of additional information, provided that such additional information is kept separately and is subject to appropriate technical and organizational measures to ensure the personal data is not attributed to an identified or identifiable natural person. So as you can see here, California is the only state where pseudonymous data is applicable in the context of all consumer rights, including rights to access, delete, correct, et cetera. For states where you know, we don't have anything checked or listed here, um, there's either no explicit statement on pseudonymous data, such as in Nevada, or there's a complete pseudonymous data exemption from all consumer rights, including the rights to opt out, such as in Iowa and Tennessee. In the vast majority of other states listed here, the ones where you see some rights listed, that means that pseudonymous data, pseudonymous data is applicable in the context of some consumer rights. So in most of these states, Colorado, Connecticut, Utah, Virginia, Indiana, Montana, Texas, et cetera, consumer rights apply to pseudonymous data for the rights to opt out only. So the key takeaway here is that there's some form of pseudonymous data exemption for most consumer rights across nearly all of the state laws, except for California. And then lastly here, the explicit global privacy control requirement. This you know, refers also to the universal opt-out mechanism or opt-out preference signal. There's different terminology used across the states, but that's what this refers to. Um, this is a signal sent by a platform technology or other mechanism to indicate a consumer's intent to opt out that's broadcast to all businesses or controllers. So in California, um, there was initially some confusion because the law tends to suggest that it's not a requirement, but the regulations are clear on the point that um, global privacy controls must be honored here. Um, and then many of the other states that you see, Colorado, Connecticut, Iowa, Texas, um, have a delayed implementation for the requirement to uh, recognize these controls. For example, Colorado requires them beginning July 1, 2024. Um, Connecticut and Montana require them beginning January 1st, 2025. And Texas requires them beginning actually on the law's effective date of July 1, 2024. So next, as I mentioned, we'll talk a little bit about um, assessments. Um, starting with um, the states that do not have a specific assessment requirements, Iowa, Nevada, and Utah. Um, California also does not yet have terms related, specifically related to data protection assessments, um, but the agency has been directed to issue regulations requiring businesses um, who process personal information to perform annual cybersecurity audits and uh, risk assessments. Um, the agency has also initiated a pre-rulemaking um, process to gather input on the content of regulations they are planning to develop related to assessments. So that is kind of in a TBD state, although we do expect to see California enact uh, assessment requirements um, through the regulations. Uh, the laws in Colorado, Connecticut, Florida, Indiana, Montana, Tennessee, Texas, and Virginia do require um, controllers to conduct data protection assessments for any processing activities involving personal data that present a heightened risk of harm. And as a floor, um, all of these laws state that assessments are required for targeted advertising, sales of personal data, processing personal data for purposes of profiling, um, where such profiling presents reasonably foreseeable risk of certain impacts and processing sensitive data. So at a base, those four processing activities are required to be covered under assessments. Um, assessments must consider use of de-identified data, expectations of consumers, context of processing, and relationship between the controller and the consumer. Many of these states allow for a single assessment to address a comparable set of um, processing operations that include similar activities. And many of them do um, allow assessments conducted for the purpose of compliance with you know, one law to serve um, for the purpose of compliance with another law if the assessment has a reasonably comparable scope and effect. So that's important to take into account as you're going through your data governance activities related to these assessments. There might be some crossover that you're able to use to leverage um, to hit all of the requirements and without as much of an undertaking. 
As Mike mentioned, um, sensitive data, uh, you know, we have opt-in versus opt-out in certain states. Additionally, the definitions of sensitive data are not uniform across the states. So this um, chart kind of outlays that. Um, I will just note that, you know, Nevada has no concept of sensitive data. So as you see, nothing is checked there. But across the other laws, you can see that, you know, certain demographic information such as race or ethnicity and religion are covered as sensitive data in all of the states that have a concept of the term. There's a little bit of a difference across the laws when it comes to sexual orientation, sexuality and sex life. Um, these are all undefined terms in the laws, and most states include sexual orientation, except for Texas, which opted for the term sexuality, and some include sex life, California, Colorado, Connecticut, and Montana. Across all the laws with a concept of sensitive data, genetic or biometric data used to identify a person is covered, as you can see here. And additionally, with these next two rows, you can see that um, mental or physical health diagnosis or condition is covered across all state laws with the concept of sensitive data, but California and Utah also include general personal data consuming or um, concerning a consumer's health. Um, so that's a bit broader than um, information related to a diagnosis or condition. Um, now, as we mentioned, California and Utah are some of the states that have opt-out requirements for sensitive data. So um, although a broader concept of what concept con constitutes sensitive data in the health arena, there is an opt out there, but I think it's an important distinction to note that there's a bit of a broader conception here of sensitive data when it comes to health in California and Utah. Precise geolocation information is not sensitive in Colorado, and that is a state that has an opt in requirement, um, but it is considered sensitive in every other state. Um, California includes certain identification numbers, account numbers, plus access codes or passwords and contents of mail, email or text as sensitive. Um, and many states include personal data pertaining to a known child as sensitive. On this citizenship or immigration status piece, you'll note that pretty much all of the laws consider that sensitive. Um, California does not as of right now, um, but there's currently a bill pending in the legislature, AB 947, that would add um, citizenship or immigration status as a sensitive data element. Um, that bill passed the assembly as of May 22nd and is now in the Senate kind of moving through committees. So I think it's just another opportunity to hammer home that even when we have laws on the books in these states, they are still subject to change um, as you know successive years happen. And it's why it's really important um, for ultimately there to be a preemptive federal privacy law. Um, so we don't see this uh, con constant you know, potential for change across the states. Next, I'll just um, briefly kind of cover off on some contracting requirements in the laws, um, starting with kind of the most simple, leading to the most complex being California. Nevada being the simplest because there are no explicit contracting requirements, gratefully, there. Um, Utah is the next, I would say, um, most simple requiring um, processing be conducted under a contractual agreement between controllers and processors, providing instructions and the details of the processing requiring processor personnel to be bound to a duty of confidentiality and requiring any sub-processors to be contractually bound to the same obligations as the processor. And I'll note that for Utah and the remaining states on this slide, um, these are contracting requirements related to um, controllers and processors, so contracts between those two entities. Um, as you can see, Colorado, Connecticut, Florida, Indiana, Iowa, Montana, Tennessee, Texas, Virginia have contracting requirements with process between processors, controllers containing these terms, as you can see here. California is the state that has the most extensive contracting requirements, not because, as you can see here, the, the nomenclature obviously in California is different instead of controller processor, we're talking a uh, business service provider. Um, but not just because there are more requirements between co in contracts between businesses and service providers, there actually are contracting requirements between businesses and the other kinds of defined entities under that law, contractors and third parties. So as you can see here, you know, businesses must enter into contractual agreements with service providers containing these this list one through 12, um, covering off on those terms. But I'll also just note that in addition to those terms listed um, on that previous slide, contractors, if you're a contractor under California law and you're, con and if you're a business contracting with a contractor, that defined entity, there are some additional terms here that need to be included in the contract. 
certifications and terms allowing the business to monitor the contractor's compliance with the contracts through audits at least once every 12 months. I think most uniquely here is that California does have certain requirements for contracts between businesses and third parties. Um, a third party is an entity that a business makes a makes personal information available that is not a service provider or a contractor. Um, and contractors between business or contracts between businesses and third parties must contain, you know, these terms here. I won't read them out to you on the slide. Um, but I think the unique part about California to note is number one, there are much more um, specific uh, contracting requirements in this regime, many of which can be found in the regulations. But additionally, it doesn't just require contracts between businesses and service providers. Contracts are required between businesses and contractors as well, and businesses and third parties. The next we'll just briefly, and I, this is a cover off on some of the exemptions. These are the only laws we have listed here are the new laws to kind of draw to draw your attention to some of the exemptions here. Um, this really is a summary. Um, this doesn't cover off on all of the exemptions under these laws, but just some of the, the important ones we wanted to highlight. Um, there are many more ex exemptions and there's a lot more nuance, I would say, than it's reflected on this slide. Um, but this is all just intended to provide kind of a snapshot of the exemptions across the states. A few highlights here is that there's some sort of nonprofit exemption in all of the new laws, as you can see, checked across there. Um, and additionally, there's some form of an employee applicant emergency contacts benefits data exemption across all of these laws as well, which, as many of you might know, differs, you know, very starkly from California, where employee data just came into scope this year with the CPRA coming online. Um, so this kind of just gives a brief snapshot of some of the exemptions, but exemptions do tend to be a very nuanced and particularized area of a lot of these laws. So it does require a lot more digging in, uh, especially if you're going to avail yourself of one of the exemptions. Okay, and now we're going to get into some of the more specifics on the um, individual uh, laws, the omnibus laws that have, have passed this year. Um, Florida is a unique one, um, won't spend a ton of time here um, due to its applicability thresholds, but there are some important points to note, um, because despite those applicability thresholds, there are some requirements for other kinds of entities that sneak in here. So um, starting with the threshold, you know, applies to for-profit entities with global gross revenues in excess of $1 billion, um, and that meet at least one of the following criteria derive 50% or more of global gross revenue from online ad sales, including providing targeted advertising, operating certain voice assistants, or operating an app store of at least 250,000 different apps. Um, so just to highlight here, although you know this only applies to um, controllers with over a billion in annual revenue um, and provides certain consumer rights related to those entities, there's an interesting definition of targeted advertising here. Um, which includes uh, affiliated websites. Um, and just want to highlight this because um, this type of definition, and it shows the, the, the importance of maintaining as much consistency as possible across these laws. Um, the question this definition brings up is whether or not first party activities are included in this concept of targeted advertising, whereas usually they are not. Um, and it's just not a great precedent to have on the book. So the use of the term affiliated there is just something that has piqued our interest and we're gonna be continuing to monitor throughout the states as other states continue to consider privacy legislation. I'll also note um, importantly here, related to that billion dollar threshold is there is an opt-in requirement for sales of sensitive data for any for-profit entity that conducts business in Florida and collects personal data. So. Um, the way the law is structured is that it does provide, you know, it does all of its requirements apply to these billion dollar entities. However, there is a specific section that applies this specific requirement to all other types of, of controllers. Um, so that's, you know, you can't just look at the Florida law and say it applies to, you know, entities in excess of a billion. That's not me. Um, it's really important to look at the terms of these laws and make sure you understand, you know, that it, whether or not there are specific provisions that might be applicable to you. Um, based on the text. The Florida Attorney General here does have um, a discretionary 45-day cure period for most alleged violations, and civil penalties may amount to $50,000 per violation and may be tripled for certain violations. Um, the Florida Department of Legal Affairs 
um, may issue rules um, to implement it. And additionally, there are some unique provisions surrounding notice, um, particularly notices regarding sensitive personal data and notices regarding biometric personal data. Um, these notices must be posted in accordance with privacy notice requirements. Um, so it's, you know, there's not a whole lot of um, detail regarding these notices aside from just the terms that they must be posted, but that is a unique aspect of this law that we want to draw your attention to. And at this point, I, I didn't say it earlier in the presentation, but I'd like to just let you all know that for CLE credit, we do have the code for you all. Um, the CLE credit code is NIST 2023, NIST 2023. All right. Next, we'll move along to Indiana, um, you know, much more in line, I would say, with the with many of the other state privacy laws than Florida, for instance. Um, you can see the thresholds here. Um, also provides um, consumer rights of access, correction, deletion, and portability, opt-outs for processing uh, for purposes of targeted advertising sales and profiling, no explicit requirement regarding global privacy controls, enforcement by the Indiana AG with a 30-day cure period available, civil penalties may amount to $7,500 per violation. Um, although there's no regulatory process here, there's a unique provision that allows the Indiana AG to publish compliance resources for controllers, such as a model privacy notice. So that could be of use to you if you, you know, operate in Indiana. Um, so keep an eye out for that when the law goes live. Iowa similarly um, is, you know, um, less, I would say, I would say different than many of the other laws we see. Um, you can see the thresholds here also has consumer rights of access, deletion and portability, opt out of personal data sales and targeted advertising, um, no explicit requirements for global privacy controls. There's a 90 day cure period available for um, Iowa AG enforcement, same type of civil penalties of 7,500 per violation and no regulatory process here. In Montana, um, we have uh, consumer rights of access, correction, deletion, portability, opt-outs for processing for targeted advertising, sales, and profiling. This, this law does require recognition of, of opt-out preference signals, which is the operative term they use there, um, by January 1st of 2025. So we do have a bit of a ramp-up period for um, that, that requirement. There's a 60-day cure period available for Mont Montana Attorney General enforcement, but that cure period will sunset on April 1st of 2026. And again, fortunately, no regulatory process in Montana. So Texas um, is one that has a, a, you know, is a bit more of an outlier. Um, as you can see here, there's no number of, you know, consumer, you know, consumers whose personal data is processed um, for uh, th as a threshold for applicability. It really applies to anyone who conducts business in the state, processes or engages in the sale of personal data, and is not a small business, though there, that, that's, that's with an asterisk because there are certain requirements here, again, like we kind of see in Florida that, that apply to smaller businesses. Um, in Texas, we have similar rights, um, a global privacy control requirement, um, Texas AG enforcement with a 30-day cure period, civil penalties of up to 7,500 per violation. And here's that small business piece I was, I was mentioning. Small businesses must obtain consent to engage in the sale of sensitive data. So while they are exempt from the threshold of applicability, there is a specific section in the Texas law related to small businesses imposing this requirement. So again, very important to just, you know, not brush these laws off by looking at their thresholds and saying that doesn't apply to me because there are um, some, you know, unique terms in many of them that would, that could impact a lot of different businesses. Additionally, this law also has similar notice requirements like Florida, where we see um, a specific notice requirement related to sensitive personal data and biometric personal data. Those must be posted in the same location and in the same manner as the privacy notice. Um, also, this law requires the Texas AG to um, post an online mechanism through which a consumer can submit a complaint, as well as requires the Texas AG to provide information related to the responsibilities of controllers and processors under the law on their website. Fortunately, again, here, we do not have a regulatory process. And then Tennessee, which will lead us into our more specific discussion of the Tennessee um, NIST Privacy Framework Affirmative Defense. Um, you can see the thresholds for applicability here, um, consumer rights, access, correction, deletion, portability, opt out of sales, targeted advertising and profiling, no explicit GPC requirement, 
Um, and there is a 60 day cure period available for Tennessee AG and reporter enforcement, um, civil penalties amounting of 7,500 per violation, treble damages for willful or unknowing violations, and the unique consideration, which we are going to discuss just now in more depth, a spotlight on their first of its kind affirmative defense option um, for Tennessee. I'm going to turn it back over to Mike here. Thank you, Allie. Um, so as Allie noted, there's a new feature that we've seen for the first time uh, in any legislation that's actually been enacted in the states uh, in the privacy area, recognizing NIST uh, as a means um, to put forward an affirmative defense. It's a first of kind. Um, we had saw efforts in Ohio through a couple of different legislative cycles, but not ever actually making it through to enactment. Um, but Tennessee did get there. Initially, was the bill was moving through both chambers. Um, it was a requirement that controllers have privacy programs that reasonably conform with the NIST privacy framework. But um, what was signed by the governor and acted in law removed those requirements, turned it into an affirmative defense. I note that because we may see variations of this in other states be introduced uh, and moved through. So what is it? What exactly does it mean? And so um, it allows for a controller in response to any alleged violations demonstrate that they are reasonably conforming with the requirements of law based on an approach taken to the NIST privacy framework. So what must you show? Um, that you've created, maintained, and complied with a written privacy program. It's designed, um, the program is designed to reasonably conform with the NIST privacy framework. It takes into account the size and the complexity of the business, the activity, the sensitive of information, um, and really doing a balancing uh, approach to uh, having a privacy program, ensuring that the program includes the full suite of rights um, and that it's not something that just sits on the shelf. It's something that's revisited um, and updated as we go. So with that, um, we're fortunate to bring in our colleague, Jamie Danker, um, again, she's the Senior Director of Cybersecurity and Privacy at Venable. Um, as important, though, um, she formerly worked at NIST, where she helped develop this privacy and clients assess their practices against the framework. And so she's going to help us better understand what the NIST privacy framework includes, what it means, how you can use it in your own operations, and share a little bit of her experience about how companies have gone about doing this. So, um, Jamie? Great. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Allie. Um, so for some on today's webinar, this may be the first time you're hearing about NIST and the NIST privacy framework. For others, you may know of NIST, but are unfamiliar with the framework. Welcome to all of you. Um, I'm hoping to shed a little bit of light on the framework for all of the attendees and focus in a bit on the who, the what, the why, and some examples of how you can leverage the framework to strengthen your organization's privacy posture, regardless of whether the Tennessee law applies to you. So a little bit about my background. I have over 20 years in privacy and cybersecurity, including both time as an auditor of federal privacy programs at the US Government Accountability oh. Office and in privacy roles at the Department of Homeland Security. Um, so one small correction to Mike, I did not actually work at NIST, um, but I did support NIST when I was a federal employee in developing the digital identity guidelines. And when I left government about five years ago, supported the core drafting stream on writing the NIST privacy framework. Um, so I've seen, I've seen insights from both the oversight and operational perspectives, and I've leveraged that to help build guide, privacy guidance, including both digital identity guidelines and the privacy framework that we're going to talk about today. Um, so I think it's fair to say when it comes to NIST guidance, I, I'm fully on board, I'm fully invested. I've really seen firsthand how organizations can improve their privacy programs through its application. And with the release of the privacy framework about three and a half years ago, it's really exciting to see adoption gaining traction in the market and the Tennessee law drawing more of a spotlight to its existence. Um, so before I dive into the origins and the mechanics of the framework, I want to highlight some of the key benefits we're seeing and hearing from implementers. Um, the first really directly relevant to today's topic is about future proofing products and services while you're fulfilling your compliance obligations. The Venable team just walked us through the patchwork of state laws blanketing the country, which we know can be a huge challenge. The privacy framework can actually help your organization take a more proactive approach to privacy risk and enable you to get ahead of that constant compliance churn. 
Um, also, when you use the framework as an assessment tool, you can really gain important insights by considering a different perspective. You're looking at it through a different lens, and I guarantee you'll be able to identify new and improved privacy activities and initiatives. Um, the third point really is about trust, which we all know in privacy is critically important. Um, it's important both externally to stakeholders and internally. It can really help build trust within your organization, and um, many organizations who adopt the NIST cybersecurity framework are looking to also adopt the privacy framework, and anecdotally, we've heard that it really helps build that communication between the privacy and cyber teams, because there are a lot of shared equities there. Um, in addition, um, when you do a third-party assessment, that can bring a higher level of objectivity and provide your management with findings that are unbiased. Um, and then lastly, accountability, another core privacy principle. When you leverage the framework for assessment, we found that gaps naturally reveal themselves and can serve as a foundation for to build privacy metrics using current and target profiles and it allows your organization to measure and report progress. So now going on to what, what is the NIST privacy framework? And I think we've just said NIST, 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 NIST without you know, defining the acronym. It's the National Institute of Standards and Technology. It's a non-regulatory agency as part of the Department of Commerce. Um, it's the information technology laboratory that develops cybersecurity standards, guidelines, and best practices that are widely adopted by government and industry. NIST has several popular risk management frameworks, including one of which many of you may be already adopting with your organizations called the cybersecurity framework. And it's also worth noting that NIST recently issued the AI risk management framework. So in 2018, NIST launched its effort to build a voluntary privacy framework to support organizations' ability to build innovative products and services while protecting individuals' privacy. This was no small task. It involved considerable collaboration through an open and public process, including formal requests for information, comment periods, and three public workshops to arrive at version 1.0 of the framework that was released in 2020. So recognizing that there's no one size fits all solutions when it comes to managing privacy risk or building a privacy program within your organization, and there are, is a quite a broad range of organizations on today's webinar. The framework is designed to be flexible and it can be used in a variety of different ways, including at the programmatic level to establish a new privacy program or to improve an existing one at a more granular level to build privacy into products and services to support compliance activities such as state data privacy law compliance when you take care to evaluate your compliance obligations through your governance and risk assessment processes, both of which are outcomes included in this framework. As a tool to strengthen accountability, collaboration, and communication within the organization, and this is really by design the way the framework is structured into its functions. Um, it's designed to help facilitate communication within the organization, both upwards and downwards. Um, and then also we're hearing that organizations want to build customer trust and establish privacy as a differentiator and the privacy framework can help with that as well. So let's go over the mechanics of the framework itself. Um, go, if you could go back one more slide, Allie. Sorry, this is a long one. Um, the privacy framework is composed of three components. It's the core profiles and tiers. And if you're already adopting the cyber framework, this should be a familiar structure that's by design when NIST issued its request for information about the privacy framework, stakeholders overwhelmingly wanted a similar structure so that they could use both frameworks together. Um, so the core is a set of privacy protection activities and outcomes that allows for communicating priorities across an organization from the executive level all the way down to the implementation and operations level. The core is further divided into key categories and subcategories, which are discrete outcomes for each function. A profile represents an organization's current privacy activities or desired outcomes, and to develop that profile, an organization can review all the outcomes and activities in the core to determine which are the most important to focus on and set both current or what I would refer to as an as-is profile and then the desired state or a target profile. Now, implementation tiers are tiers for short. Um, they provide a point of reference on how an organization views privacy risk and whether it has sufficient processes and resources to manage that risk. Tiers reflect a progression from informal reactive responses to approaches that are more agile and risk informed. So there are four tiers. The first is partial. The second is risk informed. Tier three is repeatable and tier four is adaptive. But it's really important to note here that the highest tier is really not the aim of the framework. It really all depends on your organization's unique operating environment. And it may not be practical or advisable to be a three or four in all these cases. 
So now let's go on to unpack the core a little bit. Um, so again, the functions organize the foundational privacy activities at the highest level. Categories are subdivisions of a function into groups of privacy outcomes. And then subcategories further divide a category into specific outcomes of technical or management activities. They provide a set of results that it's not exhaustive. They do help support achievement of outcomes in each category. So the privacy framework has five functions noted with the P designation, and that's to differentiate between the cybersecurity framework. There are five functions, 18 categories, and 99 subcategories. And just consider this a snack. We're not going to go through all of the um, 99 categories and functions. I'll, I will spare that for you. We'll just do a high level on the functions and provide a few examples of what that looks like and how that translates into compliance with laws and regulations. Um, so another thing to note here is, you know, it's a risk-based framework. Um, and the idea is that you might, you might find some categories and subcategories are really just not relevant or just not a priority for your organization. And since it's a risk-based framework, your profile need not include every single category or subcategory. But um, I think when you're using the framework as an assessment tool, it's useful to evaluate all the outcomes as it may spark inspiration for enhancements to your program or outcomes to shoot for in a target profile. Um, so the five functions starting with identify. Identify is about developing the organizational understanding to manage privacy risk for individuals arising from data processing. These include outcomes related to risk assessment and inventory and mapping. Govern is about developing and implementing the organizational governance structure to enable an ongoing understanding of the organization's risk management priorities that are informed by privacy risk. This includes outcomes related to governance policies, processes, and procedures, risk management strategy, awareness and training, and monitoring and review. We'll look at a couple key examples um, on the next slides. Control is about developing and implementing appropriate activities to enable organizations or individuals to manage data with sufficient granularity to manage privacy risk. This includes things like data processing policies and procedures and data processing management. Communicate is develop and implement appropriate activities to enable organizations and individuals to have a reliable understanding and engage in a dialogue about how data are processed and associated privacy risks. So these are outcomes largely related to transparency, such as communications, policies, processes, and procedures, and data processing awareness. Um, and then protect is the one that's closely tied to the cybersecurity framework related to developing and implementing appropriate data safeguards. So we can go on to the next slide. Thanks, Ali. Um, by way of example, let's use the govern function and look at governance policies, processes, and procedures, since this is really directly relevant to today's discussion on state data privacy laws. This is a function category and subcategory I would expect to see in every organization's privacy framework profile. I'd expect to see documented policies and procedures to this effect, including evaluation of legal and regulatory requirements, such as new privacy laws that impact the organization's operating environment. So as another example on the next slide um, of a subcategory many privacy programs account for is a process to receive, track, and respond to privacy complaints from individuals. So organizations can tailor their processes and policies to specific regulatory requirements, for response times, and perhaps it maybe makes sense to set the policy to the strictest standard for ease of application. So clearly we don't have time to go through each of the functions today. Um, just wanna note that many of the state data privacy law requirements my colleagues discussed today can be mapped to the consumer rights um, in the, their, the consumer rights can be mapped to the categories and subcategories in the framework. Um, you can take a look at the privacy frameworks control function and the data processing policies, processes and procedures, as well as data processing management categories to find outcomes that align with consumer rights. For example, access deletion and correction requirements. You can pair framework outcomes, including the policies and procedures with more technical outcomes concerning the ability to access data for review, correction or deletion, both of which you're going to need in order to address compliance requirements. Um, so since we don't have time to explore the core today, um, and that's you just consider that more of an appetizer or a snack, um, I hope you all will look at the full menu of the privacy framework. Um, we'll provide a link to the privacy frameworks website with the core. Um, and I think you'll begin to see the connection between your compliance obligations and the NIST privacy framework and how they can really nicely align. Um, the framework a website also includes resources that include contributions from the community that includes mappings of some laws and regulations to the framework and I believe this currently includes GDPR and CCPA. 
Uh, but before we end today, I want to give a brief overview of what using the NIST Privacy Framework as an assessment tool might look for your organization, whether you undertake it as a self-assessment or engage a third party. So at Venable, we support our clients in both compliance with laws and regulations, as well as advisory work in aligning privacy programs with the NIST Privacy Framework. Um, and when combined, we can conduct an assessment under attorney-client privilege. Here's how we've approached it. We've taken the framework and developed a set of questions based off of the functions, categories, and subcategories that we use to evaluate the extent to which an organization is addressing outcomes. We hold workshops focused on functions with privacy teams and other key stakeholders, and then we gather and analyze artifacts. Taking all these, this assessment information together, and it's important to note that this is an assessment and not an audit, we identify an organization's current profile and target profile, along with a tier for each. Assessment results typically identify strengths and areas to build upon replete with recommendations. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, so um, understanding that getting to a target profile doesn't happen overnight and may require a program to obtain additional resources in the form of tools or personnel, and oftentimes it's actually both. We also work with clients to help develop a roadmap to achieve the target profile that could be one year, two years, three years, up to five years. Um, and so here's kind of a fictitious example of what a result from a privacy framework assessment might look like putting together um, sort of the concepts of the core profiles and tiers. You've got the current profile here where their average in this instance is a two across all functions, but you see there are tier, um, tier assessments for each of the functions and then the target profile. So that area in the middle is where that roadmap comes into play. And it really is a good visual to bring up to leadership, especially if you're a small privacy program and you're, you need to beg for resources. This kind of gives you that ammunition to show like, this is where we are, this is where we need to be, and please help me get there. Um, so I hope I've piqued your curiosity a little bit about the NIST Privacy Framework and encourage you to review the resources on the Privacy Framework website. We're gonna post that in the chat as well as a blog um, I wrote about a month ago that's posted to the Center for Cybersecurity Policy and Law, and it highlights all the various ways in which organizations are leveraging the framework three years in. Um, so I think with that, I will hand it over to Mike for the last minute to close us out. Thank you, Jamie. Um, thank you, everyone, for sticking with us. Uh, there are way too many questions and too little time to go through them all. Uh, so our apologies that we won't be able to answer all of them. I, I will say, because there were several questions around nonprofits, um, Colorado is the one state privacy law that also covers nonprofits. However, um, the other laws or other states that have laws do um, have an impact on the availability of data to nonprofits, particularly when you look at the definition of sensitive personal information, a lot of demographic data, health-related data, rel you know, religious data, the types of data that for cause uh, organizations are seeking to reach audiences um, that could be limited based on the opt in requirements. Um, so that's certainly something to keep an eye on. There were several questions around B2B um, data that is certainly um, something regulated under California law as well as employee data. Um, and rapid fire precise location data. There's a couple of questions about that. It's defined in law. Um, so I would invite you to go ahead and, and look at the definitions there. Um, they are very helpful to understanding how do you think through precise location data and what that data is. Um, finally, um, just to repeat the CLE code, it's NIST 2023, all capital letters, no space, N-I-S-T 2023. Thank you again for joining us and uh, hope you have a wonderful summer.